Welcome, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Migraine Matters, Women Navigating Wellness Across the Lifespan. I'm Dr. Irina Nine, Director of Science Programs for the Society for Women's Health Research. SWHR is a thought leader in promoting research on biological sex differences and improving, and improving women's health through science, policy, and education. We are pleased today to have three distinguished panelists joining us for this event. Eliana Donner-Klein, blogger and founder of Chronic Migraine Ellie, Jamie Sanders, the author of The Migraine Diva, and Shirley Kessel, executive director for Miles, of Miles for Migraine. Not only do these three women have personal journeys to share, but they also are champions for communities of women and migraine sufferers across the nation. I would also like to thank today's sponsor of the webinar, Impel Neuropharma. We'll be live tweeting during the event and invite you to use the hashtag SWHR Talks Migraine on social media. Migraine is a neurological disease that affects an estimated 18% of women in the United States. Symptoms can include debilitating headaches, as well as nausea and sensitivity to noise and light. Migraine is three times more common in women than men, and women are more likely to experience longer and more intense migraine attacks, as well as higher levels of disability. About 17% of women experience episodic migraine, and 1.3% of women have chronic migraine, where they experience 15 or more headache days per month for at least three months in a row. One in 13 women have menstrually related migraine attacks that occur around or during her cycle. While symptoms are generally the same, the main distinction between migraine types is the frequency, timing, and duration of attacks. And did you know that an individual's type of migraine may change over their lifetime? SWHR's migraine program was founded three years ago to draw awareness to research gaps and unmet needs in migraine care. The program brings together migraine researchers, clinicians, policy professionals, and patient advocates who are passionate about improving care for those with migraine. With the guidance of these experts, SWHR has developed two migraine toolkits for patients on their journey through diagnosis, treatment, and long-term management of their symptoms. Recognizing that family, friends, and coworkers of those living with migraine may not always understand the different types of migraine and how they affect quality of life, SWHR recently launched a Migraine Matters fact sheet to build general awareness and understanding of migraine disease. So today we have three women here with us to share some of their insight and strategies as to how they've managed their migraine wellness at various stages in their life. Following the speaker presentations, I'll be moderating discussion with all of our panelists. So we invite you to use the Q&A box to submit questions throughout the event. We will start with Eliana Donner-Klein, who has been a patient advocate since 2015, writing to raise awareness about living with chronic migraine and other invisible illnesses. Her work in advocacy has been featured in Migraine.com, Teen Vogue, and her own blog, Chronic Migraine Ellie. She has consulted for migraine organizations and written several white papers on the stigma surrounding migraine in the history of migraine advocacy. Eliana graduated from Wesleyan University in 2019 with a bachelor's in history and a focus in the history of science, technology, and medicine. Today, she will talk about how she navigated her path to diagnosis and manages her migraine care and wellness in social and educational settings, particularly as a high school and college student. Let's welcome Eliana. Hi everyone, thank you so much for having me today. I'm very excited to be here and also to be sharing a little bit more about my uh, story pathway to diagnosis and managing migraine um, as a teenager and young adult. Um, so I was diagnosed when I was 15 with episodic migraine following a seven day attack. Um, it, you know, I quickly saw a neurologist after who prescribed me some acute medications, but uh, within the span of about six months, it became very clear um, that it wasn't really working and also that I was having uh, more, more migraines per month. So episodic migraine means that you have less than 15 attacks per month. Chronic means that you have more than 15 attacks per month and last for um, for at least three months. 
So in addition to that, um, I also found out that I had both menstrual and non-menstrual migraine. And so for the next two years, from when I was 15 to 17, um, I faced a lot of issues with treatment and um, navigating new disability in my life, as I had previously been someone who had been able-bodied and had had various hobbies um, and really enjoyed being an active person. Um, chronic migraine was a very different um, experience for me. And it was also um, compounded by the fact that uh, th I really struggled to find providers who understood um, the intricacies of headache and migraine treatment. So part of the reason why that was so difficult was because in addition to chronic migraine, I also had status migranosis, which is an especially severe and long lasting form of migraine. And I also had intractable migraine, which uh, meant that I did not respond well to the usual therapies for migraine. In addition to this, I also had central sensitization, which is a condition of the nervous system that's associated with the development and maintenance of chronic pain. So when this occurs, the nervous system basically goes into a process called a wind up and it gets regulated into a persistent state of high reactivity. So things that shouldn't have been triggers for me um, became triggers and I was experiencing daily pain and daily attacks um, about seven days a week. So for an entire week, uh, for months on end. And a major part of um, my problem with my pathway to diagnosis is um, I saw about 10 neurologists within that two year period. Some doctors um, didn't really know what to do with migraine. I was a very complex case and uh, there wasn't a lot of medications at that point um, that were specifically for migraine, most were off label. So one of the approaches was here's a drug, take it for three months and come back and we'll see if it works. But that was an issue because I was a high school student who was trying to get through and do my studies and waiting for three months wasn't really an option because I needed to be able to read, write, focus, function in a normal capacity, which I was not able to do with such extreme pain. Okay. Additionally, um, I also had a couple of neurologists who were like, it's just stress, um, which obviously stress can be a factor in migraine, but it, it isn't the underlying cause. And additionally, um, some neurologists and some of the physicians that I saw just said I was too complicated and they didn't know how to approach my case. So all of this points to a made to part of like the larger issues in medicine, um, which is one, the lack of education for non-headache specialists for migraine and headache disorders. Typically, there's around four hours um, of education in medical school around headache disorders, which, as we know, is not enough given the complex complexity and individuality of a lot of these disorders. Additionally, um, there's a lack of access to headache specialists. There's only about 500 head headache specialists for about 40 million patients in the US. This is also um, made worse by the fact that because there's so little um, headache specialists, there is also problems with waiting lists. There is also um, problems with transportation because if you don't have a headache specialist available in your area, you're not gonna be able to travel or it takes a lot of money to be able to travel and get that care. And finally, the also, um, migraine is also a disease that is under-researched, under-diagnosed, and under-treated. So when I was 17, um, I was very lucky because I was able to get off of a waiting list and be seen at the Cedar sinai Pain Center by a doctor named Dr. Stephen Graf Radford, who unfortunately has passed away. But he was the first doctor who recognized the toll that, that chronic migraine was playing on my life and the level of disability that I was experiencing. At the end of my intake appointment, um, he looked at me and said, I'm gonna help you get your life back. And that was really a breakthrough moment um, for me and also for my care, because no matter how complex it got, he was continually trying to find new therapies or new combinations of drugs to really help me um, be able to get back to a normal sense of functioning. Um, which was also very interesting because at that point I was 17 years old and uh, the Botox uh, procedure had just started. So I was 17 years old and I was on Botox and an anti Alzheimer's drug, which is a very interesting thing to explain to other physicians. But part of all of this also connects back to the issue of health literacy because chronic migraine um, is a disease that is a chronic pain disorder as well. And it can be very difficult to describe pain to family, friends, teachers, and physicians. Um, pain is very individual. What someone may think is a 10 out of 10 on a pain scale, I may think is a five based on my own level of understanding. So part of what we need to do is we need to help people with headache disorders learn how to describe their pain. So family, friends, and educators can understand and help support them throughout their journey. 
Um, we also need to help non-headache specialists better understand the complexities of migraine as well. So that way then they can also understand when patients come to them and diagnose um, migraine and help them get the correct resources. So this all connects with accommodations because in schools, um, there are generally accommodation programs with a Dean of Disability Accommodations um, or guidance counselors that can help students be able to get the resources that they need. And for me, this was a very, this is an interesting process because I had previously been someone who had said, I don't really need the help. But when I got sick um, and when I became disabled, accommodations became the reason why I was able to graduate both high school and college. And it wasn't because, you know, I didn't want to do the work, um, but part of it was because I was going up against educators who didn't have an understanding of what migraine was. And I needed additional help in explaining what was going on and why I needed those accommodations. And part of that was me and also my family being able to help educate those um, champions to help communicate with professors and teachers who, despite having, you know, letters of accommodations and, you know, having walked through them, really understand this is why I need flexible deadlines, because there will be days that I will not be able to function, go to class, take a test, or do the prep work to write an essay when I can't, you know, look at a screen, write anything, or just string together sentences. So part of what I want to also just quickly touch on is that navigating migraine as a young adult um, in educational systems can also be very just it can be hard to navigate emotionally um, because you see other people who are around you who seem like they're living normal lives right they're hitting their deadlines they're going and doing things with friends and it's also extremely important and it was a very hard thing for me to go through talk about and come to terms with is that living with migraine isn't necessary, it's not an end, but you have to figure out how you can navigate your own life, what makes sense to push yourself for, what doesn't make sense to push for. And so um, basically, I think my, my biggest piece of advice for people who are navigating um, schools and other types of higher education institutions is look for those champions, look for those offices, look for the people who will stand up for you and help you navigate that system um, while you're going um, while you're going through it. So that way then you're able to do the best that you can um, and do and, and get the reasonable accommodations that can help. Um, so I think that is the end of uh, my comments right now and I'll pass it uh, back. Thank you so much, Eliana, for sharing your story. Um, I'd now like to invite Jamie Sanders. Jamie is the author of the award-winning blog, The Migraine Diva, where she chronicles her personal journey with migraine and as a patient advocate. She has lived with migraine since the age of two and her migraine attacks have been chronic and intractable for 15 years. Jamie serves on the leadership of the Disparities and Headache Advisory Council, also known as DIHAC, through her advocacy work and blog, Jamie's mission is to make a very invisible disease um, visible to the rest of the world and to validate the real pain of millions. Today, we have invited her to share how she continues to manage triggers and migraine in the workplace and in her home life. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you, Irene, and thank you, SWHR, for hosting this webinar and for including me in this very valuable discussion. As Irene said, I did have migraines since the age of two. I had my first migraine attack at the age of eight and I remained episodic until my first or my last pregnancy where I experienced my first episode of intractable migraine. And at the time I was 23 and I was working full time. I was in school full time in the evening and I had two small children at home and uh, my husband was in the police academy. So it was a very busy household. And it was something I had to learn to work through. Um, and I learned new things on how I could get through my workday with this new diagnosis of intractable migraine. And the important thing for me was speaking to management um, at my employment. Um, I had an open relationship with my managers and I was able to speak with them freely 
and letting them know what my situation was, one took a, a burden off of me of having trying to push through. But having that conversation allowed me to ask for accommodations and workplace accommodations are very important when you do have migraine, despite rather it being um, episodic, chronic, intractable, um, you have a right to accommodations. And for me at the time, this is in early 2000s, this is 2001, I believe. Um, I wasn't able to ask for a lot, but what I did get was being the ability to work without the lights on, because I worked in a in a in an area where there were other people there. So I didn't have my own office, but everybody agreed that it was okay to work with the lights off. And I took as many breaks as I needed. Um, and asking for a flexible schedule was really, really helpful. Um, going to my HR department and talking with my benefits counselor and talking about what I have available to me as far as family medical leave and how I can use that for all of my doctor's appointments if I need to take time off because of the migraine and how I can still be protected and what the policies were for my employer. All of these things were so helpful, helpful for me to keep me in my job, keep me productive, um, keep me present. Um, it eliminated a lot of absenteeism and presente presenteeism um, for me at that time and allowed me to focus on my health, which was very important. Um, for people today, what you can ask for are very small and expensive accommodations that your employer should be able to provide for you, um, including a screen filter for your computer to help block out those blue lights um, that can trigger migraine, cause eye fatigue and eye strain. Replacing fluorescent lights with more uh, with different, different lighting that is more susceptible for someone living with migraine, um, having an ergonomic chair or a keyboard or asking for a flexible work schedule. If you're able to come in later in the day, it, for example, you have more migraine attacks in the morning, if you can work later in the day, they'll allow you to still be more productive at work or being able to work from home on days where you can't come into the office. But again, I had small children and I still had to manage my migraine at home. And my children have gone through this journey with me. They were two, one, and I was pregnant at the time of my first intractable migraine. And they're now 23, 20, and 19. And I'm still chronic and intractable to this day. And they've gone through this whole journey with me. So that meant the way I managed my migraine at home and had to manage motherhood changed frequently. And I had to learn quickly that I can't do everything on my own. And learning to ask for help was a big thing for me. And learning how to pace myself was extremely important because I never knew what each day was going to be like until I got up that morning. And when you have children, it's unpredictable. It's not on your schedules, on your children's schedules. So as much that I could control on my own, I tried to control and do things in preparation for the week if I could. What worked for me in managing my migraine at home was getting things done on the days that I had enough spoons to do them. So whether that be preparing crock pot freezer meals one day of the week and having that in my freezer, I could just pop that in the crock pot in the morning and just let it go. And I could just go and take care of myself. That's one way that I was able to eliminate having to cook every single day. Um, when my children were in um, grade school, they were in charter school, so they had uniforms. So I would pick one day of the week to wash and um, dry and iron their uniforms for the week and hang them up. So all I had to do was just pull it off the hanger and get them dressed preparing their lunches. I would try to do as much prep work as I can at one time where I'm feeling good so that I don't feel like I have to drag myself through a, a bad attack to get things done for them. That was really, really, really helpful for me. Um, the biggest thing for me in managing migraine through my journey of becoming chronic, intractable, refractory with my children was speaking with them about what migraine was and how it affected me personally. 
and having a conversation with them in terms that they could understand through their developmental years. And that took a lot of pressure off of me as a mom to be this superhero in their eyes um, and let them know that mommy does have these limitations, but I'm still able to be there for them. And in the process of explaining this to them and having them be a part of my healing, like bringing me my ice packs or my water for my meds, um, it created em empathetic children and compassionate children um, who are now adults. So I think speaking with your children and learning how to manage a migraine at home is very important. For myself personally, I made sure to take time out for myself to for self care and to take care of myself when I needed it. I had a do not disturb sign that I would put on my bedroom door when I was meditating because I needed that time and that space and that grace for myself. Um, I use multimodal approach for treating my migraine. So besides medications and things like that, I make sure I have my cryotherapy. Um, I have my, I do my regular meditations and um, I just pace myself and gauge where I am each day and say, okay, what can I do today? How many spoons do I have today? What can I accomplish? As my children were getting older, I started to involve them more in things around the house, delegating chores and tasks, making sure that they knew how to cook certain meals. If I was unable to cook, I could take them to the store, have them pick out whatever they want, bring them home, and they can make whatever they want, and I'm fine. I can go and take care of myself. Learning to know what your limits are and involving your family in helping you keep things together and make them functional without you being the one keeping everything together all the time was super important for me to learn, and that's something I try to share with everybody. Um, and through all of this, of course, I have to monitor and manage my triggers. And there are quite a few of them, you know, managing my food triggers and watching what I eat. And that does affect how everybody else eats in the house. So we all have to eat pretty healthy, fresh meals made every day, limiting takeout and fast food, um, and involving everybody in the food journey. Um, at, for me, it was kind of fun. Um, and having the kids involved in the kitchen and choosing things and showing them there are healthy ways that you can eat delicious food. Um, sleep was very important um, and having a strict sleep hygiene um, was very, very, very imperative to how my next day was going to be. Reducing the amount of um, screen time before bed and doing meditations before bed and just getting myself in a place where my brain can quiet down because my brain is firing all day long. So getting it to a place where it can just relax, calm down and, and afford me the chance to have a good night's sleep was very important. Managing physical activity and exertion, um, that is a specific trigger for me. Um, so exercising does help, but I have to pace myself and, um, I do things that I know that my body will respond to without erupting into pain. So finding what those things are for you and staying within that limit is good. Managing stress, um, super important. Um, again, I do that through um, mindfulness and meditation and relaxation and managing my comorbid conditions like depression and anxiety. For example, going to a pain psychologist to help manage all of that is very helpful. So there are certain, all, there's all these different ways that you can work through migraine and manage yourself at home, if you have children or not, and still take care of yourself. I hope these tips and tools were helpful and I'll give it back to Irene. Thank you so much, Jamie, for sharing um, your experience and um, and even how you engaged your family throughout the process. Um, now I'd like to introduce Shirley Kessel, a professional migraine advocate with more than 35 years of experience in medical administration, teaching, and nonprofit volunteering. She currently works the executive director of Miles for Migraine. With a passion to finding a cure, 
She creates opportunities for people to advocate, learn, and be a part of a thriving community so they can teach their friends, family, and employers how to change the message about migraine disease. Shirley became chronic at age 25, forcing her to leave behind an MBA program, and two of her daughters inherited migraine. Today, she will share with us how migraine has changed over her lifetime and her journey with living with migraine, not only as a patient, but also as a caregiver of family members who also suffer from migraine. Shirley, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Irene, for having me, and thank you to um, the Society for Women's Health for doing this amazing uh, webinar today, very necessary. And I've had the opportunity to work very closely with Jamie Sanders and everything she just said is, I could just say ditto to. So I'm not gonna repeat what Jamie just said. I'm gonna come to, from a different perspective as a much older person now, I'm gonna be 60 this year, I'm proud to say. Um, I do have chronic migraine and I've lived with migraine almost my entire life. I can't talk about the present without first revisiting the past. I should have been diagnosed at 17 when I experienced the worst headache of my life. Uh, but instead, I wasn't diagnosed until I was 25. Um, when I became chronic, I, I woke up with a horrible headache that day um, and it didn't go away for a year. Uh, I, well, and just backing up, I did grow up as the eldest of three children with a mother who was so severely debilitated by migraine that she would retreat from the family for days at a time, plagued by severe vomiting that prevented her from keeping oral meds down in her stomach. So as luck would have it, a family friend who's a doctor taught me how to give her injections of medications when I was only 16 years old. Um, so I like to say I've had migraine since the day I was born because I remember my mother lying in bed um, even at the early age of five. So she had to take these narcotics um, and that's all that was available back then, which enabled her to sleep. Um, the lack of presence disrupted our family life. Migraine is also known as wegraine. It affects the entire family. Um, I was really responsible for taking care of my siblings and my very unaccepting and confused father. I loved, loved him dearly. He did not get it. Um, but when I was finally diagnosed at 25, no one told me anything like this could be a disease for life or you may get better for a while and you might get worse again. You could pass this on to your kids. Instead, my doctor, who I really, you know, I, I can't say enough good things about him. He really did work closely with me. Um, he's, I was engaged at the time and he said, just get pregnant you'll probably get better. Um, so I did after I got married. And luckily for me, he was right, but this is not the case for all women. Um, in the fourth month of pregnancy, I felt amazing again, like my former, former self. So what's the lesson here? Well, there are many, but here are just two that I would like to share. Ask questions, a lot of questions um, of your provider. You may not get a lot of time with your provider. So see who you can get to know in the community that's a trusted resource. And don't believe everything you hear, um, especially like the gazillion of suggestions when you try to play Dr. Google and also on Facebook closed groups. I know a lot of people find solace there. It's good to have a community of people. I will say that you really need to have a tribe of people to work with you that also have migraine, but just be careful how much information you take from them um, because this disease is so different for everyone. As Jamie said, it's, um, you know, we're all different. It, it, migraine is, is as unique as snowflakes. Um, anyway, uh, at 25, when in that year I had a headache every day, I tried over 20 medications and none of them worked. I went back to my doctor every four weeks because back then that's how things were done. It's not done that way now. Um, and of course I was hospitalized, which also did not help to break the headache. But I will say this, as you age, try those meds again, because with every aging year, my body has changed. And I did get put back on some of the preventives that I had at my, in my younger years. And they did work the second time around. Um, but when the triptans worked in my thirties and forties, they stopped working in my fifties. So if at first you don't succeed, try again, because you never know, this is a very misunderstood disease. 
Um, so I just want to shift a little bit and talk about what's helped me immensely when I started at a very young age. Uh, I'll say first that there's a very famous Buddhist saying, pain is inevitable, suffering is optional. And what does that mean? Well, allow me to explain. It was quite by accident that I started a yoga practice when I was 31 and I'm now 59. Once I embarked on this yoga path, I eventually stumbled across meditation, MBSR, which is mindfulness-based stress reduction, positive psychology, mindful eating, and the journey goes on. But to summarize, if you learn to get good at something that helps to reduce stress, increases your awareness to the body, your body, and how the mind works, which is a really important thing with migraine, because along with migraine often comes anxiety and depression, you may just learn that when the waves get rough, you can learn how to surf. So ultimately, I learned quite by accident that the pain would come in big gnarly waves and all the other symptoms that came with migraine in addition to the pain, but I learned to ride the wave and give over to the wave and radically accept that I could not change the wave, I eventually no longer suffered once I realized that. What I'm saying here is that the practice of mindfulness taught me to welcome the migraine attacks. As I would welcome an unexpected guest at my door, the pain and nausea, the brain fog, the blurry vision, the anxiety would come but I learned how to change my relationship to the attacks. I learned that pain was inevitable, but it could be in the background and just stay there. And also the anxiety and the depression while I continued to move on in my life. Nausea, nausea is a bodily sensation and I could give over to it or I could use the skills I had in my mindfulness toolkit to ride the waves. And I'm not saying this is easy. This has taken me 20 years to get to this point. I want you to understand that I've been practicing mindfulness since 2007. Is that 20 years? Well, not quite, but <laughs> um, it's been a long time. And the same goes with other symptoms. Don't get me wrong. There are times when I must fall into bed and sleep or just lie there waiting for the attack to end. But what I learned is that turning toward the storm was better than gritting my teeth and wanting, wanting, begging, hoping, praying that it would just end. And don't get me wrong again, like I said, I'm not saying this is easy and it's not, it's not. And it took me so many years of practice, but I did learn to change my perception to pain and other symptoms. And I'm also saying, I'm also not saying that this doesn't suck. Guess what? It really does. I hate it. And I wish my life was different. I really do, but it's not. Do I wish that my my middle daughter is not having chronic migraine and every day like her life is, is awful, I think, in so many ways, but she's plowing through. I've been a role model for her, I think. Um, this change of perception also helped me to understand that I should not be afraid to speak up. Jamie, like Jamie said, you know, you have to ask for help. And also when you feel stigmatized, um, and I need help, I just ask. And I will talk to a stranger about migraine because at this age, it gets a lot easier. <laughs> You'll say whatever you want. And so don't be afraid to ask questions. Get what you need from your healthcare provider. Learn to advocate at work with friends and family and even strangers. Yes, I'm saying talk to strangers. Um, unless we all advocate, we will never get better treatments. We'll never get access to the ones we have now. And we do have a lot of new treatments out here and we have some in the pipeline. And I'm very excited about what's in the pipeline too. And eventually we'll get a cure. And if you are not into mindfulness, mindfulness, don't worry. It's not for everyone. So instead, you know, do your own self-care routine. So if you take nothing away from this, just try this. Learn to make advocacy part of your treatment plan. I wish doctors would prescribe advocacy for their patients and maybe one day they will. Advocacy comes in many forms from speaking your migraine to talking to anyone, to joining a Miles for Migraine Walk One Relax event, a support group, a social event, whatever works for you. So I'm gonna stop there and say thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Uh Thank you very much, um, Shirley, for, um, for sharing your story. Thank you, Jamie, 
and Eliana. And I invite you now to all turn on your videos so we can have the panel discussion. This has really set the stage for the Q&A portion of this webinar. Again, um, we invite participants and attendees to use the Q&A box to submit your questions. We'll try to address as many individual questions and also common themes as we can during this portion. We might not be able to get to them all. Um, I want to start off with one question for, for everyone. And that would be, um, you guys had all mentioned addressing, doing some behavioral health therapies, meditation and things. How did you go about finding a provider who would specialize in that, either biofeedback or CBT? Um, it's we you mentioned a headache specialist as well, and so can you can you talk a bit more about that? I can respond to that, Irene. Um, for years, I was just seeing um, a therapist to treat my depression and anxiety. I had CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, but as my migraine progressed and got more difficult to treat my headache specialist put in a referral for me to see a pain psychologist. And that really was a game changer for me. The difference between seeing a regular psychologist and a pain psychologist is that they work with patients who have chronic pain and they use mindfulness a lot in, is, as far as their techniques to help manage your pain, help you figure out what your cues are, how to breathe properly and how to give yourself permission to take care of yourself. Um, learning how to manage both is very difficult, specifically with migraine and depression. I call them the two beasts um, and they're constantly chasing each other. Um, when one is flaring, it will trigger the other um, and you're constantly combating both. So having the right tools to learn how to cope with both, especially when they're both flaring very severely is, very important, is an important tool and has helped me tremendously. There aren't many pain psychologists, unfortunately, available to everybody. There already is um, a deficit in the amount of behavioral health specialists in the country. So it is a challenge, but try to utilize um, different tools that are free, free apps for meditation, um, relaxation, guided imagery. There are a lot of them that talk specifically to pain, um, anxiety, and depression, and learning how to work through that. Um, it's important for us to know that we are not our disease, um, and we tend to personify our symptoms. Once we're able to let go of that idea and know that it is okay to not be okay, and that it is okay to put ourselves first, especially as women, you know, and even more especially if we're mothers, we put everybody first, but you can't fill from an empty cup. So please be sure to take care of yourself. You're worthy of that. You're worthy of being in a good headspace. You're worthy of being able to know how to function through high episodes of pain and not beat yourself up for it. So having these tools is so important. If you're not able to get to it um, via a pain psychologist, there are other ways that you can learn these for yourself. Um, and Shirley gave great examples of that. Um, and just remember that the catalyst for this and the motivation for this is you deserve to do this for yourself. Oh, thank you. Um, and so we're in a pandemic and one of the things that was noted was screen time. How have you managed screen time and how it affects or potentially triggers your migraine during the last year and a half? I can answer that. I would just say that I'm on my screen more than I would like to be, of course. Uh, I do take breaks. So one of the greatest things about working from home is that you can work, you know, a 10 hour day, but you don't really work 10 hours. You work, you know, a couple hours, you take a break. I'll go for a walk in the middle of the day. You just have to take care of yourself. Honestly, you just have to know that screen time is not good for you. And when I dic when I reply to emails now, I dictate into my phone. I answer a long email from my phone 
and dictate rather than type. So that's helped me a lot. And kind of along that vein, what other tools have you guys um, incorporated into your life? You mentioned the, the dictation tool. Um, there was a question that I do want to um, pull up. It was in written answer, but I want it to at least be verbally on this, um, on this video. Um, there was an attendee who asked about going to the ER and the doctors not understanding their pain um, scale and believing them when they say it's a number 10. And Jamie wrote a response that um, talked about a, a migraine diary and having it written down, having the headache specialist write something on the letterhead that basically talks about the diagnosis and regimen. And so that was very helpful to be able to give to um, a healthcare provider who's not familiar to give them the breakdown so they understand how serious your condition is going in without having to take them through this whole story every time. And I can imagine that that might even be helpful to have in other settings other than the emergency room. Yeah, I'll, I'll expand on that answer a little bit, um, Irene. For years, going to the ER, urgent care caused a lot of anxiety for me because I didn't know what physician was going to walk in the exam room and how they, they were going to um, approach my my pain and a lot of times we deal with a lot of gaslighting and dismissiveness um, in those scenarios so i learned this from a really really close migraine sister of mine and it was getting a treatment protocol typed up by my headache specialist or you can get it done by your neurologist or primary care physician um, on letterhead and it gives a brief synopsis of my diagnosis. Um, it explains what my current treatment regimen is, what has failed me in the past, and usually what events lead me up to having to go make a visit to the ER urgent care. And at the bottom of that letter is a specific treatment protocol with the medications I need and, the, and their doses in order to break that migraine. And it is signed by my physician. That's really hard to ignore. Um, and I keep this in a binder. In my binder, I also have a list of my prescriptions, a list of all my allergies, past surgeries and procedures, upcoming appointments. So they can't deny that this is a true condition. I have this disease. It's well documented. I am currently treating it. And I'm not in here seeking drugs. It's a lot of work and onus on the patient to do that. But unfortunately, because of the stigma behind migraine and the lack of education, that um, students receive in medical schools behind uh, on headache and uh, headache disorders and migraine, we have to do this right now. Um, and that's my suit of armor. And um, it's been very helpful for me. It's allowed me to get the treatment I needed and to get home quickly. And it's alleviated some of the anxiety, not all of it, it's still there, um, but it does make the process easier. I'll add on to that. Everything that Jamie said is entirely correct and is really, really good advice. Um, I'll just note that one of, you know, a great example of this is when I was in high school, I was on an orchestra trip in Chicago. I was based out of California. That's where I lived. And I did not have this. And um, luckily my parents there, we were able to go to the ER and they gave me an IV drip of saline, told me to sleep it off um, because they didn't want to treat me. So after that point, we did a very similar thing of making sure that I had all the medications that I needed, um, you know, if I did need to go to the ER and that, you know, we had direct lines to my, to my physician in case we had any trouble um, while we were at the ER as well. So if, you know, it does take time as Jamie said, but it's extremely worth it because having that resource available means that you actually will most likely get the um, the help that you need instead of being saying, eh, you're not really in that much pain. And especially um, this is something that women face and specifically also women of color face as well. Um, so, yeah. You know, we've, I can imagine and we read studies that have chronicled lived experiences um, of women or individuals who have migraine. And, you know, what, oh, my coworker has migraine and she's fine. My sister, she, you know, curl, balls up and has to sleep off the whole day. There's all these wide variety of experiences. 
Um, but there are people who want to support. And so I guess, can you speak to what, for those who may not have migraine, but are looking to support somebody who does, what pieces of advice would you give to them in understanding? I, I would say the first piece of advice is believe me. And, and a lot of people, I don't, right now I can feel like it's starting to brew and I'm like, man, I just took some medicine you know, but I look fine. Right. So I think there's a lot of other advice. I think, you know, Jamie certainly gave good advice about incorporating her family, um, into helping her. And it does teach you to be compassionate. I would agree with that because, uh, I learned from an early age, how to take care of my mother. And so I wouldn't, you know, I was told like, this is what you need to do. And so I did it. And as a caregiver, so I've been a caregiver and I've been a person with migraine and I've also cared for two of my three daughters. And so there is, and if you have migraine and your child has migraine, there's like this fine line between, okay, like, can she really go to school today? Like, I think she can do it, but she's telling me no. That's a really hard um, bridge to cross with your child. And so, you know, sometimes you just have to know like when to be a little push them forward and when to hold back. And that's really hard. So I would just say, you have to ask a lot of questions as a caregiver. Um, you know, it's hard to measure pain, right? So I wish I had the right answer, but I don't. So anybody else want to step in, go ahead. I will say that um, specifically when it comes to um, family or even a close friend, a best friend, having them come to an appointment with you um, and involving them in that process and having them, you know, ask questions to your doctor so they can get a better understanding. Um, that's helped me a lot um, in my marriage with my husband and helped him get a better understanding of what this disease is, how it's affecting me. And also it allowed him to ask questions that I might not have thought of because he can see things that may be different about the way um, I'm acting or responding to things that I may just not be aware of. And he can bring more things to light and shed um, a bigger picture, share a bigger picture of what it's like being living with someone who has migraine disease. Um, that's very important. And sharing information. If you come across something that spoke to you and really resonated with you and explained in a way that um, connected you to like this really shows and and describes what life is like for me and sharing that with the people around you <clears throat> has been really helpful too for a lot of people um, and going to support groups um, and finding support groups for caregivers is important they need support too um, a lot of times you know, they go through this battle with us and they're just not supported and they're kind of in the background, you know, dealing with it silently. So making sure that they're well supported, that they're able to discuss their feelings around it so that there isn't any um, resentment towards the person living with the disease so they have a healthy way to cope um, and express their feelings is important too. Yeah, I'll also add um, two things. One about navigating, you know, social relationships, social relationships with migraine. Um, you know, none of my friends in high school and college, um, you know, everyone knew of someone who had had migraine at some point. Maybe that was a family friend or someone else, but um, not to the level of disability that I had been experiencing. And one of the most powerful things I think of, you know, the last six years of my life has been really focusing on educating my friends, not even in a, like sitting them down doing a presentation, but just saying like, hey, I have a migraine. I'm not gonna be able to go to this activity because I'm experiencing dizziness and nausea and I have extreme pain and I need to go lay down. And what's been amazing is that actually um, some of my friends, especially in college, realized that the headaches that they were experiencing were actually migraines and they were episodic. They weren't happening very often, but then they were coming to me as a resource to help them as they were navigating that change. And one of my best friends turned chronic um, about two years ago. And it was 
I, I navigated that change by myself and with my family, but it has been amazing to be a support to her and to help her through this journey of saying, okay, like this is, you know, this is what's helped me. And this is the advice from the migraine community and from the migraine organizations out there that you can apply to your treatment protocols and how you're dealing with migraine in your everyday life. That's really important and really key, is, which is, you know, a migraine is a really individual disease. My symptoms are not the same as Jamie's, as the same as Shirley's, but we're all dealing with a similar issue together. We're all dealing with the same stigma. And so advocacy, it can be on many levels. I mean, part of it is just advocacy is on a very personal level with your friends as well. Um, so I think, and additionally, the, the second part of that is um, sometimes that education will also help you um, get to a point where some people actually know your migraine better than yourself, kind of like what Jamie just said. Um, there, I have times when I have migraine and I don't realize that the attack has started. It's either I don't realize that the pain has started, but I have certain tells. And my partner has now gotten to the point where I'm being like, oh, I, I'm starting to not feel great. And he goes, are you having a migraine? And I'll say, I don't know. And he goes, well, you said, I don't know, which means that you need medication because when you cannot make a decision, that means that you, you know, you've surpassed that point. You need to take the meds. And he's, it was amazing because it was something that I didn't even realize was the tell for me, which was, I didn't have the most, like the the capacity, the functionality to just say, Hey, I'm having an attack. I need to take my meds at this point. And he's able to do that for me and help me navigate that. And some of my friends are actually able to do that as well. Thank you. That actually, um, it kind of pulls into, of course, people understanding and how it comes in various ways. And it can be very um, prohibitive of being able to move forward. We have a question. Um, someone, a Karen has discussed uh, that she has a challenge with aura and it can affect her up to 20 minutes. She's not able to see anything. Um, for I've, I'm not sure if any of you guys have experienced that or, if, or at least you're aware. What are some things that you can provide as far as advice on therapies or treatments for prevention or managing aura during an attack? I don't have aura. Um, is it Jamie, Eliana, do you have aura? I do. You do. Yeah. Um, oh, but I want to answer happen. the second part of Laura's question, please. Go we, for it. You go first. You go first. Um, well, my my aura is is doesn't happen all the time, but when it does, honestly, one of the best things that I can do is lay down and get any vis like anything anything that I can do to get myself in a play, in a safe environment where I'm sitting, laying down and that I can just close my eyes, relax, and realize that this is going to pass. It's not going to be forever. This is an aura. And um, in terms of preventative or um, other therapies, you know, unfortunately, I don't think any of us, um, and any of us panelists are doctors, we can't give you medical advice about what can be used. Um, there are a range of preventative um, and acute medications that can help with attacks, um, and specifically can also help um, before the onset of the attack as well, before like that aura really um, comes to comes to a head. So I would say um, that you should definitely talk to your primary care physician or to um, a headache specialist about creating a treatment regimen that works for you. Um, Cause there are actually a, a, a wide range of drugs right now that are available uh, to treat migraine. And Shirley, take it away. Okay. So Laura, you also asked about, <clears throat> um, most people see migraine as just a headache and I just put in the chat a link to um, an infographic that the Headache and Migraine Policy Forum made, which I actually helped them because the way I explain migraine to people is migraine is a neurologic disease. I don't say disorder. Um, I don't say problem or whatever. I do say it's a disease because it is uh, it's something that right now is believed to possibly stem from the brain, but there's also a question as to what's the connection between the gut and migraine, but anyway, I won't go into that. But I think it's important for people to understand that headache is only one symptom. And it's also very important that we use the proper terminology when we talk about migraine. Migraine is a disease that I have all the time. When I have an exacerbation of symptoms, that is called a migraine attack. 
And so it's important for people to understand that the headache comes along, but all the other symptoms I have are exacerbated by the attack. And so um, we just like, we don't say asthma, we say asthma and we say asthma attack. It's the same thing. And, and so to what I've done is I've made a list of all my symptoms and I actually have them on my phone and I have shared that with people. And I would say, here is what migraine is. And so I've got ringing in my ears. It never goes away. I have a dry eye. I have um, brain fog. You know, I might have some GI disru disruptions. I mean, I have a whole list. But I'm not going to go into the whole list right now to save time. I think it's important that we explain to people. And that's a form of advocacy. So enough about that. I see that we are coming close to our close. And so I, before we wrap up, I do have one last question for each of you to answer. Um, we have patients, we have researchers, clinicians, policy professionals, industry that are all watching um, our webinars. And I want you to, to, if you could give a takeaway, each one of you to think of a takeaway that you'd like to recommend our viewers to our viewers to help them understand how to support or improve care for individuals with living with migraine. Um, I guess we can start with Shirley and then Eliana and then Jamie. Okay, and I'll, I'll, and Karen, this will answer your question. The answer is advocacy, advocacy, advocacy. And the reason is we don't have enough federal funding to do the research necessary to find a cure yet. And the only way we're gonna get it is if we all stand up and make our voices louder and do whatever you can to um, be an advocate in any way that fits for you. 100% agree with that. And I'll also add, um, there are a lot of barriers to access, access to headache specialists, access um, to treatments. Um, there are a wide range of policy issues um, that, that can address this. So, you know, we really need to be looking at, you know, are treatments accessible, which the answer for most migraine patients is no, based on insurance and formularies. Um, and then additionally, you know, access to, um, to just having a headache specialist, access trans to transportation to get to a specialist. Um, so really just ident identifying and addressing some of these access issues for um, migraine and headache patients. And I'll add to that, so that we need to have a more inclusive um, environment and community in, in regards to headache and migraine. Um, there are more than just the typical image that we see when it comes to migraine and headache. Um, making sure that we are doing our best to go into communities that are often neglected and figuring out how many other people that, you know, we have 39 million Americans living with migraine, but there is such a huge number of people who are undertreated, underdiagnosed, and um, we need to address those people as well. Um, so being cogniz cognizant of the fact that um, this is more than a middle-aged white women's issue, um, it's, a, it's a worldwide issue. Thank you all very, very much. Um, you've, you've closed out nicely with giving um, those key nuggets of information and advice. We thank you for joining us for today's events, um, sharing your amazing stories and your insight. It's very invaluable. And I hope that those that have attended today have gotten um, something that they've been able to take away to apply for their own and for those that they know that are um, suffering from migraine. I'd also like to thank Impel Neuropharma for their support of this webinar and SWHR's migraine program. We'd also like to thank everyone who participated in the development of Society for Women's Health Research, Migraine Resources. And again, we invite you to connect with us on social media and visit our website, www.swhr.org to download our migraine patient toolkits and fact sheets, as well as sign up for our newsletter. Lastly, we'll send out an email with the recording of today's webinar to all registrants. So please be on the lookout for that. Again, thank you for joining us and have a wonderful rest of your day. <laughs>